This video is sponsored by Call of War. Sign up using the link in the description box below to secure 13,000 gold and one month of premium. Hey guys, Diplex here again. Welcome back to Call of War. Today's video is a bit special. We're gonna react, or reflect rather, to about a year's worth of custom Call of War games, all played rather differently. Basically, I'm gonna go over what I've learned and what my experience has been in the half a dozen or so games we've played together. So, stay tuned. I think it'll be pretty interesting to find out. You guys have also asked me to host another custom Call of War game, so I'll be announcing that in the next video coming out very soon after this one. And it'll be a bit different to the other games I've hosted. So, let's get started. Alright guys, we're gonna let this first video play, and I'll probably skip through it because it's pretty long. I wanna kind of react to every single game we've had so far. And in this first week of Call of War, not so much happened. This is actually also my very, very first game in Call of War. And at this stage, everything felt so unforgiving. Um, I think a lot of you guys who joined me in this game were also new to the game at this stage, which is why you and I have grown more experience and gotten better at the game over time, which has made it feel so much more unforgiving and hard. I played Sweden in my most recent game as well, and I played it so differently, everything felt so much harder, but I also did so much better. Um, so it'll be interesting to kind of know how, how different, and see how different I've played Sweden one year apart. So, at this stage, everything is pretty uh, simple and straightforward. Uh, in this 100-player game, almost every player starts near a, a neighboring AI nation. In this case, I started next to Norway and Denmark, who are both AI nations, and it just made sense, even to a new player like me, to attack them. Uh, the AI is in this part of the game and at this stage and at least in this patch which mind you was a year ago is very passive and it's just meant to give the player some sense of achievement and success by just being able to conquer an enemy nation even as a new player that's a, a good feeling and that's a good morale booster if you're if you're playing a different type of European scenario perhaps the 22 player one I do believe um, it'll be very different you're you're basically starting next to players um, at the beginning, you don't have any neighboring AI factions to conquer easily, and that's going to have to make you think differently. I don't think everyone's just going to go to war with each other straight off the back, because uh, you know that you start with the same number of units the enemy has, which kind of leaves too much up to chance. You want to you want to have a few days of, of uh, technological advancements and being able to build more units, perhaps different units, that can make your tactic work better than the enemy tactic. We're going to discuss tactics as well and the choice of units later on, because as I said, in my most recent game playing as Sweden, I had a really strict unit plan. In this one, I kind of just built everything. Tactical bombers, I built infantry, armor, static weapons. I even think I built a few naval units. But I've realized that if you play as a coalition, which we later did here, uh, we had Finland, Arkhangelsk, Italy, and... Excuse me, I have forgotten the last nation we included. Could have been Poland, I do believe. Uh, we, we formed a nice Baltic Union, and it made sense because we could all expand outwards, and it felt very safe. In a later stage, uh, we would all have gone with different units. Like, in the last game of Sweden, my coalition all pretty much had different units. Uh, we had one mechanized, which was, which, which was me. I did a lot of mech units. I did an, an exclusive mechanized army, one could say. And uh, Finland had a lot of static weapons and artillery. Germany and Poland went with a lot of air force, especially Germany. And that was very cool to see. But um, yeah, so this, this first week in my first game of Call of War was kind of not so challenging. As I said, a lot of you guys who joined the game at that time were very new to it as well. And there was just a lot of fun coalitions and stuff. It, things got more serious over time. So let me know in the comment section down below. Was this your first Call of War game like me? Or were a lot of you who joined this first Call of War game not new to the game? Had you guys been playing for months or years prior to it? Let me know. Because look at this. It felt, I just, it felt very accessible. I could move across the seas and conquer Iceland without just really being stopped by anyone. Um... Alright guys, so this is week two to three in my first Call of War game, and I had my first taste of betrayal in this one. So when you're a five-player coalition, that's still five separate nations with more or less 
five separate interests. You're always going to care more for your own nation than your own coalition. And in this case, Finland went to war with Arkhangelsk um, over Leningrad. Finland wanted the 20 point uh, victory location, which was Leningrad in this case, which is uh, the old capital of Arkhangelsk. I thought Arkhangelsk should return it or uh, he should have it back returned by Finland, but Finland refused. And I saw it as my duty as the leader of this coalition to instill um, trust and security among the nations, part of it. And I, I basically had to put my foot down there and, and knock out Finland. I was lucky too, because Finland didn't really have any troops on the border, and most of his troops were down fighting in around Leningrad. And uh, basically, I'm sorry that happened. Finland was a valuable player. Every single coalition member is valuable, but when one person um, becomes aggressive towards another one or just forgets that, hey, we're all allies and maybe I should return his very important capital to him, then you have to act. And it's it's sad, really. It was actually, it felt, felt weird. It was the first time I attacked an enemy player and it felt real. Like, oh, this is not an AI. This is, I could lose because this is another player. Uh, I also overexpanded. Um, this was my first lesson. Why you shouldn't overexpand. Why you shouldn't send some kind of expeditionary force to Canada and, and hope that the Canadians will be Oh hey, welcome, welcome to North America. Yeah, you're you're Deplex and you're you're recording this game and everything, and we're just gonna let you just take this neighboring AI faction out or whatever. No, that's not gonna happen. Look, you've got uh, I believe this is this is uh, Quebec that I took out. Uh, he wasn't part of a coalition, so I thought it was safe. But you have Ontario here, you have the the East Coast down here. Like even if you're not attacking them, or even if Quebec in this case wasn't allied with these guys. You're not going to want a foreign power that is excluded from your coalition, that isn't even part of your um, your uh, um, continent. You're not going to want him to set foot on your land. And I realized that later on as well. In my other games, I've always had a strict policy against North America moving into Iceland or, or Great Britain. I've said, no, that's European matter. Don't do that. And it's interesting how you can be allied with someone or friendly to another nation, but completely just reject the idea of them setting foot in your own continent. Waters in this game is a huge safety barrier, which is why it's important to have a navy. A small navy can sink a large transport fleet. But that's just another lesson, and I thought that was really cool. Um, I believe at this stage, since Finland was out, I, I'm not sure if Italy was out, but we, I did receive some allies here in the east. I realized how important it is to have allies beyond your enemies as well to set up a two-front war. That's kind of part of why Germany lost the war. That's a two-front war. Um, that is a very important lesson. Um, later on here, um, a, another thing became very, very relevant or very apparent to me. Um... Uh, S larger single nations will perform better than uh, coalitions in the same size of the like territorial size. So if you have five nations part of a coalition like we did pretty much here, right? Or four. We probably total the same number of provinces that Syria and Iraq did in this case, or perhaps just Iraq or Syria. But being a coherent nation, being one nation controlling all of this and having everything under control will perform so much better than the same number of nations with the same number of units because Poland and Arkhangelsk might be might be AFK when I and Italy attack or the other way around which is why you always I feel like collisions is a good idea but if all collisions can grow to that same size independently as the enemy nations then that is going to give you a really really good chance of winning which is something I'm going to reflect on later on as well when we played as Iraq in a future game, one that we actually won, as I'm sure you know. Um, and this is the end of week two and three. I believe I had just retreated from Canada at this stage, or I was sending more troops there, which is another lesson. Um, whoa, 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 we skipped really far ahead here, sorry. That happened earlier on, um, and I believe the final video will tell the whole story. If things felt safe here, and then things just went downhill. So what I learned from this was do not spread out your units so much. This is the game summary of my first Call of War game. Um, I think I pulled, tried to pull off a last stand near Iceland. That did not work out at all. Last stands simply don't work out. Even if you have a strong navy or great artillery or whatever kind of defense, the, the number of provinces you have are not going to be able to support your army. 
um, and uh, you're gonna lose provinces and whatnot. And this here later on showed you how powerful Iraq and Syria became. Uh, they went nuts. And this was my first my first taste of endgame action and just to see the armies and everything just made me feel a bit nauseous almost. I'm like, like I could never win that. Oh, actually, I, I, I do think I pulled everything away from Europe uh, back to Canada for some reason. But look, Ontario's 68 stack is just going to diminish my 24 stack here. So that was GG. So what did I learn from this first game? Um, size over numbers, definitely. The size of your nation over the number of nations in, in, in the coalition. That's like 100% the best way to go about it. Don't attempt a last stand. It's not going to work. You better just finish yourself straight away. And uh, second of all, uh, don't spread out your units so much. I should have known that it was a bad idea to move troops to Canada and waste efforts here. I probably sent half my army there. And then I had half my army over here, the other half, rather. And then I had units sitting around for a show of force in Italy because I thought they looked pretty. No, put them all to use. There's no point in having them anywhere else other than the front against the enemy that matters. I should have known that, but this was my first game, so I did learn a lot from this. Um... I, I also saw this mistake of sending troops for this whole imperialistic idea across the nations in the most master in the most recent game, the Master Rivals game. Uh, Romania sent a lot of troops to Canada, and he wasted them. Probably a twenty stack just went there to to, to die. And why, I don't know why he wanted to establish himself here, but he was a level level one player in that game, and I was a level one player in this game as well. Well, I did grow a lot, but still, you catch my drift. You learn a lot. Down here, there was just some cool naval fights. It was just a, it, it was awesome to see this for the first time. Now, here's my second game as the UK. A uh, very different nation to play, an island nation, one could say, of course. Dublin, and rather Ireland itself, was my first target. It made perfect sense. Uh, this is what my nation looked like after about a week of playing. I put all my resources and uh, technology towards researching artillery and naval power. As you could see, we're gonna skip through a bit. Um, I didn't really ally anyone in this game because I realized coalitions can drag you into some pretty nasty wars. I built uh, dockyards everywhere. I spent a lot of money on resources. Uh, I did send some units out to just keep an eye on the, the nearby waters to make sure no one was attempting to get in. Um, and battleships is what I spent money on. I thought battleships, big nasty old ships, they are going to sink pretty any, much any destroyer or cruiser out there. And they would. I actually had some pretty cool naval battles against, I do believe, Puerto Rico. The Kingdoms of America here moved in to cross the Atlantic to attack me. And I had a great naval battle against him that I was absolutely winning. But then his submarines came along. So I also realized, okay, having just battleships is not going to mean you're going to own the waters. You need a, a great variety of units in your fleet. Uh, here's another look. We're going to pause the video. Uh, I had railway guns uh, all over the place as well. Because I thought, hey, if they do land an army, my railway ra railway guns will, will destroy them. At range, yeah, but not in the numbers I had. So this was also another lesson like, okay, so you can't really just do a bunker nations with a bunch of battleships and cruisers and everything because you're not going to have the same industrial capacity as a non-naval nation. If if France here owned the entire, you know, mainland Europe and wanted to then go to UK without having any naval units, he could simply build them a lot quicker and a lot better and a lot more to then just make my whole navy uh, just pointless, I suppose. So, playing as the UK, I think it's important to jump across the canal, uh, expand into mainland territory. It's important to keep an eye on the fact that you're going to need a mainland army. If you're alone and you don't have coalition members, that is something you're going to have to do. If I was allied with other nations, I could have gone full naval and not worry about any land units whatsoever. I could have been the naval guy. Karma Cut in the most recent Master Rivals game... I saw that he was pretty much the full naval power of that game. He had submarines, aircraft carriers, and everything. And he had a few elite mechanized divisions to, to do some of the conquering of his the small AI nations out in the Pacific Ocean. Which made perfect sense. But, yeah, I ended up losing this game to an American Navy. Um, he, if, In all fairness, Puerto Rico was also a naval nation. I do believe part of that coalition. But when once the landings came, I couldn't just... I could not resist it. I would have had an ally that focused on uh, ground power 
land power and I could have focused more on naval power. Who knows? Perhaps I just didn't build enough submarines, perhaps I had a bad naval layout, but this was my second game overall and I learned a lot from this. This was my third game as a North American nation and in this game I had a completely different idea. This was very, very ambitious and this also um, turned out to be an experience that was going to teach me to uh, not think so big when it comes to including so many players because everyone has their own will, everyone has their own personality, their own ambitions, and also their own temper. There was going to be a lot of internal conflicts among my dear allies. So in the announcement video for this North American game, I, I, I set out to make a massive North American coalition. Uh, we were going to have the Northwestern sector, we're going to have the South Western sector, we're going to have the the, the, the the Northeastern sector and the Southeastern sector. We were practically going to be four massive five or four player coalitions form one great empire that could resist everyone else. This is when I, when I attempted to do that. Instead of all just fighting each other and losing our own units in wars, could we resist the South? Could we resist the East? Just basically building a massive coalition. Um, and I thought so. We had our flanks secured here. Um, unfortunately, we should have probably shared map earlier, but we were all allies at this stage. Oh, yeah, there were some internal conflicts here that I didn't appreciate, but I, I couldn't just police everyone as one small nation here. Um, so that's something I realized as well. We did work together in this game a lot to, to battle the South. This is Goyas. He was just insane. He went with his whole thing here, and I thought maybe we could all resist him, uh, combined forces. Uh, but not everyone... Not everyone played nice. Um, half of our empire helped us. The other half probably saw their own survival in helping Goyas. So having that many coalitions and that many players trying to work together was a nightmare. And it didn't work. So I, at this stage, I also realized that the largest, the highest level of um, communication is probably inter-coalition. But among the coalition members of your own nation, that is going to work. The rest is not. That was a shame, a, a real shame, but um, it's probably possible if you're all friends and if you can arrange it in Discord and you don't have any spies or anything like we did in the Master Rivals game, because that's when we tried combining more coalitions, but um, a four or five player strong coalition is, is a good bet, but I think it's, it's almost better to form a coalition with other players and other continents so that you can expand fully and then just form this massive coalition. That's something we did in the Iraq game, which came up after this one, I do believe. But very nice experience. It was a good attempt at having something like this work, but it didn't. One of my favorite games, the Iraq game. Um, Syria, Saudi Arabia, and Persia. We were a four-player coalition. We could all expand in our own direction, one could say. I went north, Persia went east, Saudi Arabia took the peninsula, and Syria was gonna move west, okay? I realized too, like, I can't just take Kuwait down here or, or Doha or whatever this nation is just to, um, and be, and, and, and sit quietly for a while. I knew I had to expand north, which would mean going into Turkey. I was fortunate enough to kind of catch them off guard. Um, they tried pulling a last stand in Ankara. That wasn't going to work. I, I knew that as well. And I really felt confident at this stage. This was just a big confidence booster. I had taken out an enemy player this early in the game. I was even accused of Turkey being my, my secondary account. I don't know why people would not imagine the, the possibility of me, as a fairly experienced Call of War player at this time, not being able to deal with an enemy nation. Like, what kind of bullshit is that? Give me a break. Um, and I also realized at this stage, like, what had the other enemies done that have had won previously? Well, they had, instead of just forming alliances and trying to be big in, in, in or finding security in numbers, I knew I was going to find security in size. So, after this, it was just going north. North, north, north. I pushed through. I did a lot of damage. I had a great variety of units this time. I, I caught a lot of enemies off guard. I used my submarines nicely. I played my artillery, I played my armor to my strength, and I, I and I spread out nicely. This was my first really successful attack. This felt really good. Oh boy, look at this. Yeah, this is looking better. Uh, Persia, um, being part of my coalition, had friends in India. I told him to attack India. He didn't want to attack his own friends, so that became an internal matter. Once again, you have to keep an eye on that. You can't control your, all your coalition members. You're not all going to share the same... Um, 
the same idea but you have to make new friends i made new friends in africa and you made friends in i made new friends in europe and in the east and this turned out to be one of the best experiences now where i succeeded militarily i felt really certain this was going to be our game this is something we were going to win at this stage poland was part of the coalition um i had turkestan and kazakhstan part as well greece was still part of it because he had a lot of good units he was small but good units and i had friends over here as well saudi arabia was loyal till the end even if even when he was kicked out of the coalition because we had to make space for algeria or, or french sudan and libya and whatnot just because it was e easier to to um, to um, communicate, um, he, well, he, um, well, he he understood that, and it was really nice to see that that he that he understood it. Um, Persia, I dealt I dealt with Persia by getting a lot of uh, hastily built units here because I had a lot of factories and, and and industry. So this was the first setback I had in terms of resources. I overextended. I built too many units. I had too much action going on over here. I should have had them down here, possibly, and perhaps let Poland do the conquering of this himself. Um, so that was a major setback. I lost a lot of provinces. But at this stage, we had a great coalition. This was going to turn out to be a, an amazing endgame win. So now we're Sweden, and this is my most recent game. I played this one very differently. Yes, I had a coalition because I knew it was very important in this kind of game. Uh, this was a 1v1v1 in the sense of me versus Karmakut versus Jackie Fish. So I had to kind of make sure I had allies nearby that were loyal to me or the channel. Um, and uh, this time around, I decided to focus on mechanized units. I built uh, no barracks whatsoever, so that was going to save me money. I did not have to focus on food that much. I could focus on getting steel and oil and rare materials, which is a... I have a lot of steel. Sweden is one of the biggest steel nations in the game. We had a lot of oil too. I could mass some massive armies. Unfortunately though, your coalition is only as strong as the weakest link. I think Germany played a great game. I think Poland played a pretty good game. He became inactive towards the end. Romania did well at a start. He felt like a strong ally, but he he committed the same mistakes I committed previously, which was basically to send troops off to Canada over here where he would lose them and just down the Suez Canal elsewhere. It didn't make any sense. Um, some of the neighboring factions here that we should have taken out earlier to expand our, our, our size, unfortunately, were inactive, so they never came to play. Uh, we tried having some intercontinental alliances with Africa, but once again, size would trump the numbers. So this was a great experience. This was the best game I've had so far. I thought I played really well. The enemy was simply stronger, but it was nice to know that how, how incredibly powerful I felt with the kind of tactic I had employed. My armored divisions that were basically anti-air armor and artillery, all self-propelled and mechanized, did amazing. They destroyed every single opponent early on, but later on, his air force became too strong, their numbers became too strong, and they came in on the eastern front here, where we couldn't beat them. But over, I mean, in a situation like this, when he even had more units to begin with, I diminished him completely, and that was cool to see. So, what did I learn? Well, from one year of playing Call of War, we're gonna kinda let this video finish off. If you're gonna be in a coalition, Divide the um, your your areas of, uh, of focus among your nation. Uh, basically, have a naval power, have an air power, have a land power, and have two supporters of, of any other size where you can focus on things, right? If you're playing alone, go for size instead of numbers, okay? Like, always expand. Don't trust allied nations or neighboring nations that seem friendly just to sit there and hope they help you out. No, they're just going to sit there and waste your future provinces, your future ability to expand. God, this was such a... Uh, like, this year has been really, really interesting. I've won one game where I played things like I should have. I've been lucky to expand. I've had good allies, and I made allies across the other continents, which made my Iraqi game the best one I've had so far. I, however, learned much from that game in terms of what I should focus on and how I should maintain my resources. But in the Sweden game that I had afterwards, which, which was this one, I couldn't employ it... Well, it just... I wasn't going to be defeated because of resources. It was simply because we had greater enemies to the east. But I, I still think this was one of the best games. So in this case here, you can see some of Karma Cut's units. And you can tell they are mostly naval-based over here. And I suppose his other allies here, part of his coalition, were more land-focused. But it did not give him a victory. Here is uh, Karma Cut's naval blockade. And uh, yeah. Thank you guys for watching this one year summary. We're going to get more games going in the future. Hopefully you thought this was a fun video. Hopefully you learned... Uh, something as well. I learned a lot. 
um, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Ciao.